we are trying to look at what are the things that we can do in this region to support the dynamic workforce needs of our region and also start collaborating where we can. Look, there'll be some things that we won't be able to address today. And before today, we asked you to answer a few questions. There are things that we will be able to look at, like what actually workforce development is occurring, what isn't. But some of the things that are out of scope are things like industrial relations. Um, unfortunately, we can't lift everyone's pay rate, even though we'd love to do that. Um, the other thing we can't do at this level is I guess affect some of the other things we know impact the workforce like short-term contracting. We know that that's an issue for many of the workers in our region and we're going to um, uh, struggle to deal with that today. But there is many things that we can do which we think is through better career um, and education information which has longer term um, outcomes. I think that's um, where I want to leave it for now. But what I want to do first is, is I actually want to run a little bit of a poll, if I could. Um, now, this poll, um, sorry about this, I'm just working out, this is where I asked you to uh, just be patient. <laughs> um, this poll that we've got to today is really about working out um, what, um, what your needs are with regard to your understanding. And I'm having a little bit of trouble getting activated that poll. So I'm just going to try it from another session if I can. Just bear with me. In fact, I'm just going to ask you the question and I'm going to ask it if you wouldn't mind just answering it through the chat room if that's okay. Um, so my first question to you is how aware do you consider aware sorry are you? Yeah, sorry. The poll has appeared. It has appeared. The poll has it's appeared. Up. My gosh. It took a little bit of while. I'm so excited. That's wonderful. Yeah. So to what extent are you aware of the job roles associated with promoting gender equity preventing family violence or responding in your organisation? So that question is, um, what extent are you aware of those roles? Are you very aware? I know where they are, I know where they sit. Um, are you somewhat aware? Not really, not at all. Or it might be um, that it's my understanding that the organisation is not funded to do this work. And I wanna thank my colleague, Lucy, for making sure that magic happened. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. So, Lucy, if you can hear me, it might be that you can actually ask us to... Yep, I've unmuted myself. So I've got about 62% um, who've selected that. So I'll just let it run for a little bit longer because it's quite Thank a you. lengthy question and I'll share the results very shortly. Thank you. And then we'll go on to the next one. Yep. As well give me a sec i think i'll we've got most coming through now so i'll end the poll and share the results for everyone thanks lucy can we all see that and how's it looking lucy so what we've got is we've got um 40 46 percent um, are very aware and know what these services are and where they sit in the organisation, okay. um, following by 43% are somewhat aware. And then a couple um, are not really aware um, and one person or two people have said, um, don't have any idea if we have people doing this work. Okay. So, yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Lucy, if you don't mind, we might launch the next poll, which is all about skills development, people's awareness about how you develop skills in your organisation. So I don't know if people can see that coming up. One minute Thank to, you. Um, to share it. Yeah, so we've got an understanding about people's understanding about what roles exist. So this one's about saying, well, do you know how you develop the skills in the region? And as that's coming up, we asked a few people about how aware they were about some of the broader workforce initiatives that were on in the region. I found it really interesting. We offered people about nine options 
in that questionnaire, but most people knew about three or less. So I think there's a really interesting opportunity there for us to learn a little bit more today. Lucy, does that poll come up? Unfortunately, I can't find the second poll kit. I've only okay. got access to the first one. So no worries. someone well, else has scared the skills development just, one on my behalf. It's all come up. Is Beautiful. That's wonderful. The mysteries of it. I love it. So um, aware of how skills in promoting gender equity prevention or family violence can be developed in your organisation. Very aware. I absolutely know how I will develop those skills. And through to I'm not aware. I don't know. Don't know is a good question. And have to thank Amrit for putting that up. Thank you, Amrit. So again, so, we can um, see the majority of results coming through. So we'll give you a couple more minutes. How are we going? Um, Amrit, did you want me to end this poll and share it with everyone again? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Brilliant. Good team work here. <laughs> so hopefully um, you can all see the results that we've shared. Um, and again, really positive that over 50% are very aware of the skills development pathways. Um, and that staff have these skills and use it with a further 20% being aware and nearly 20% being somewhat aware. Um, Wonderful. So that's really helpful. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, without further ado, I am now going to introduce you to uh, Rachel Green. Rachel Green is um, one of the leaders at Family Safety Victoria. And um, Rachel is going to present to us on some of the key initiatives that are occurring um, in, uh, in the, the region and particularly around the family safety, um, family safety uh, area. So, Rachel, without further ado, I am just going to share my screen now. So. That's great, Kit. Can you hear me? Very well. And can you see great. your screen? I can see the screen. Thank great. you so much. Keep you just let me out, know. Everybody. Thank you. Yeah. I'm having trouble with my uh, technology today, so thank you, kid. I really appreciate it. Too easy. Hello, everybody. Um, Rachel Green. So I'm the Director of the Centre for Workforce Excellence in at Family Safety Victoria. Before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the many lands that we're meeting today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal colleagues with us here today. So um, as Kit said, I'm gonna give a bit of an overview in relation to the broader family violence industry plan and some of the work that's progressing um, underneath that, probably more at a statewide level. Um, and then really keen, I think, to get a sense of what is um, some of the issues, uh, opportunities, and some of the uh, particular uh, things going on in the Southern region. So I'm so pleased to be here today. It's a terrific idea for a forum and congratulations to the organisers. I think incredibly timely to start kind of honing down as, as things are developing around Marum, but also the broader um, you know, work that's underway with DEAD in relation to educational pathways. I'm also very impressed with the poll. I think that's um, enormously useful as a quick uh, assessment as we head into a discussion like this, really helpful. So thank you for setting that up. And so Kit, we go to the next one. Um, um, you will all know this well, and it's probably more just to hone in and apologies to those who know a lot of this material well that I'm going through. Um, hopefully we'll try and keep it as a point where everyone's gonna come out getting a bit more inf new information. Um, so the Royal Commission is obviously our frame um, and the work that sits underneath the Centre for Workforce Excellence um, is not only in the industry plan, but is the implementation of the MARAM framework 
um, and the Family Rights Information Sharing Scheme. More broadly, Family Safety Victoria, which was one of the um, key things coming out of the Royal Commission to deliver and drive some of the significant initiatives such as the Orange Door, the Central Information Point, um, and it also supports, as you know, specialist family violence and sexual assault and behaviour change, men's behaviour change workforces across the state. Of key relevance, recommendation one, which is the, the, the MARAM, the review of the CRAF, to, uh, number 207 is the 10 year industry plan of which we are currently in the first three year action plan building on the foundations um, and REC 209 as it's known um, and many of you will be part of this journey and the policy development around what mandatory minimum qualifications will look like for the specialist family violence response sector. Thank you, Kit. Um, the next one I think gives a bit of a bit more detail. I think importantly, as you've called out in terms of this forum, um, we are talking the, the industry plan covers the continuum from prevention to response. Um, so very different workforces, um, a really, you know, complex history, a lot of the response family violence sector carried a lot of the prevention work, the work over the last 15 years from Vic Health, Our Watch, Women's Health Services has, of course, given us a platform around prevention work. And I think the, the work from our end and the onus on the work in Family Safety Victoria and debt and from Women's Health Services is around how do we continue to support that prevention workforce. Also calling out there, so we've got the, the three year plan of which we are in the second year. So that was launched late last year, 2019, um, is the two capability frameworks. So this was one of the critical things that um, the Royal Commission really highlighted is the actual articulation of what the skills that are required to do specialist family violence response and prevention work were not clear. Uh, we all knew we needed to do family violence risk assessment, advocacy, case management and support, but unpacking that and talking about what is the job role design that we're talking about for the sector was a very clear need that the Royal Commission basically said the industry plan needs to support and drive and facilitate. So those two uh, capability frameworks for response and prevention, which are on the Family Safety Victoria website, were released as one of the first cabs off the rank around trying to build an articulation of what this critical specialist response role looks like and what it's required. Thanks, Kit. Um, next slide mm. is, sorry, is... Um, um, for a bit more detail about REC 209, and I don't want to go into, you know, a whole lot. It's, it's not a, um, it's a, it needs a bit of time to explain this policy. The key things, I think, is that we're now starting middle of next year. A couple of reasons for that. The, the Commission talked about an end of 2020 to commence mandatory minimum qualifications for the specialist response sector. Given COVID, given the challenges, given the enormity of what the sector is managing, um, we've pushed that to mid next year as a start date. So I think some of the key things that we've heard from um, the sector and a lot from Aboriginal service as well in relation to this policy, which has informed how we're thinking about implementation, is that we need to exempt the current workforce. So. Um, for those currently uh, working um, in services, in response services, uh, they are exempt from that. Of course, they will still have access to educational pathways and skills development and PD and all of that sort of stuff. But in terms of what we are creating and building as a sector going forward, it will apply to those coming in. There'll be a transition period. So it doesn't mean that from July, everyone needs to have a bachelor level uh, equivalent or equivalent. Uh, doesn't mean that. It means that from the middle of next year, we start this transition period. We start Sorry. thinking. Sorry. Yeah. Me? No, it was me. I'm sorry. I'll flick to the slide too quickly. Sorry. Oh, that's right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so just, just more that point. Always be a pathway for people with lived experience and always be a pathway for people with um, cultural experience. So um, that, I think, has been a very... Uh, you know, very significant part of the feedback from the sector about the context mm. of the work that this is undertaken in. So uh, a couple of services, um, including Kit um, and Chisholm, are part of the REC 209 uh, subcommittee, and we can provide more detailed info about that, and we will. 
The next two slides, Kit, thank you. Um, and I might go to the, the number six, if that's helpful, give you a little bit more detail, very happy to circulate these about um, the outcomes of the census. So the, these reports will also be released um, in, probably in the next two months, next months to two months. So a um, number of you will have participated in the workforce census that was um, undertaken earlier this year. Um, we're really grateful for you to do for, for doing that. Prevention was a terrific outcome. I think we had over 100% response rate. So it's given really good data in relation to what that workforce looks like, what the qualifications are, skill level, training needs, uh, supervision, you know, enormously useful data, which is the thing that we really need in relation to how do we then support organisations to support workforces and what do we need in relation to training and education pathways. So on this slide, I think some of the, the things that we call out, we know this is an incredibly committed uh, values driven sector. Um, and so it's an incredibly valuable workforce, I think in that sense, what people want and come in um, and wanting that are the gaps are around the strategies around retention. So the thing that we're here to talk about today is one of the key issues that people have raised. There is not enough career pathways that, you know, and that, that again, the Royal Commission called that out, the structure uh, of, and the context of family violence services for which exam was quite different than sexual assault services, as many of you know, because of that different kind of history. So in terms of the industry plan, that's one of absolutely uh, one of the key challenges. Health and wellbeing was also a critical part, uh, not for discussion today, and, but many of you will have been involved in forums talking about the impact of COVID on workforce health and wellbeing. It's something certainly I think we've learned a lot about. Um, through this period around how do we support the sector, support the sector working remotely from home, doing this kind of very intensive, difficult, um, difficult work. Um, so um, the next one, I probably won't, I just wanted to signal, it's probably more of a, I'm on slide seven, thank you, Kit, um, is more this a whole lot of other work going on that so intersects with, with this. So the family violence sector model concept, which was the review of family violence case management, which again, a number of you will have been part of and been part of consultations around. This is going to be give a critical, um, uh, I don't know, kind of, given you this, well, provided this information for those that aren't aware, because it's starting to articulate again, what does that crisis response look like? And it's going to really help us then articulate and pull out what is the nature of the workforce and the skills uh, and competencies that we need to support that kind of work. So it's more uh, a flag that and all of the work that you will also be, you know, having touch points with different guidelines that are underway and have been developed since COVID too, um, are all in, in view for us. So I think that's a real call out that we can't do this um, without a mindfulness in relation to that broader, broader work underway, let alone, as Kit said, and what we're not talking about today, but the, the context in relation to, to pay equity and so on, all of these things are, you know, we know are those the foundational challenges. Kit, I might move briefly on to nine. How am I going for time? Oh, you're going fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm on slide nine. The Marum, a lot of you will know, and I think wanted to call, call this out because for those um, who are in prescribed workforces, so under law, you'll be um, needing to align your, um, your policies, procedures, practice guidance and tools to Marum. Um, this has been kind of one of the first kind of levers, I guess, to think about workforce capability in relation to family violence risk assessment and management. So um, that phase two, and uh, I'm very happy to talk more if people are less familiar and we can send out more information, are coming in next year. But, but you know, that means that the, really the bulk of the sector will be now prescribed under MARAM. So, so much of the training and resourcing we're doing is about thinking about how to uplift um, the range of sectors and workforces that are not all going to be skilled in, uh, are skilled in, in the sense of where they're up to around their responsibilities. So for a maternal and child health, they are looking at brief and intermediate training um, in relation to MARAM. Um, hospitals are coming in next year, GPs are coming in next year. So 
different parts of government are thinking about what does that mean for these workforces which are going to be prescribed. Mm. I think moving to the next one, this kind of goes, I think, to some of those, the actual tangibles of, of where the skills are. So probably messaging before, a number of you will have known of DVRCV has obviously been delivering family violence craft training for many, many years. Um, they are delivering under MARAM the uh, comprehensive, the renewing practice, the leading alignment Sorry. for organisation, organisational leaders. Um, but we also, they cannot do it alone. Uh, we need more than, um, you know, one or two or three specialist RTOs to deliver this training. So a big part of the broader strategy is about uh, really working closely with TAFEs to think about what it means in relation to um, delivering accredited training. So what, what is currently in the field is um, the first one on that, that left column. So that what were the identifying and responding which is the screening and ID. Um, that is currently in, um, in the field, as we say, but the tapes, it's online and a number of tapes are delivering it. So I think it's, it's um, I'm sure Swinburne will talk to this. It's, it's such a critical shift and a number of tapes are uh, really picking this up, have been also have been doing the work for many, many years as well. Um, and I think part of the commitment from the Department of Education is we need a space where all TAFEs are delivering quality training to enable and skill up the breadth of the workforces that, that need to be. So both in currently in terms of, you know, building from a base of uh, current skill level as well as pre-service. So that's also part of this picture is how do we actually think about embedding it in all of your nurse um, grade certificates all the way through. So that gives you a picture of where we are. We've got one credited course underway. Um, intermediate, brief and intermediate is coming. That should be early next year. Comprehensive uh, accredited training is, is a bit further down the track. We're developing a grad certificate, which will really support REC 209. Um, that's a next year element, as well as looking at accredited um, courses in relation to prevention as well. So. A number of again of you are on on this um, in this field in this Zoom will be um, participating and contributing to to that because we can't build those without um, industry input, of course. So that's a very quick snapshot of um, the accredited picture. The next one, I think, um, is another kind of underpinning uh, element of what we need to uh, support the sector. Um, in relation to really the core issue around recruitment. So um, for those who have used the jobs portal, which was kind of launched um, earlier this year, um, your feedback around how that's going will be, you know, will always be helpful and keep sending that in. I think the intent of this is to create a, um, a location of where those, uh, um, you know, with organisations can use to share uh, obviously the jobs and their, the gaps and what they need to fill. What we are doing significantly is trying to drive people to that site. So the current phase two of the campaign, which we're up to, is about targeting um, uni students, um, which you know we're all doing and, and there'll be so many um, pieces of work going on locally to do that and Rose Burrell's work and around the grad, uh, the social work grad, um, certificate people coming out is, is a key element, I think, of how do we try and do that consistency in a space where we've got a Mental Health Royal Commission coming down and we know the call on these kind of graduates or just, you know, good workers is going to be significant. So that's, that's a big part of the work of the industry plan at the moment. There's elements around that, around building, trying to build diversity. So we're thinking about targeted elements of those campaigns as well. Retent, oh, just a, a, I suppose one comment, I think what the census really told us is we've also got to work on retention. So, you know, and, and a lot of that goes to, again, elements around pathways, elements around ensuring that these jobs are, that, that you know, jobs within the sector are, are well supported and, you know, have, have all the right infrastructure around them. I think um, the next slide, sorry, Kit, I've just got two more to go, um, is yes. just to give you a picture around some of the other pieces that's underway. We've had a uh, Women's Health Services project um, 
a really critical part of the work, and I'm sure there'll be discussion about that today as well. Um, elements like fast track, so how do you target um, emerging leaders within the sector? Um, and then FISI, the um, Future Social Services Institute, not FISI, um, is, is, uh, has a range of leadership intensives, which again, some of you might have uh, been part of. So part of that was also the industry plan saying you can't have a one size fits all, you have different parts of this sector. It, you know, there's different elements around leadership we need to um, pick up and, and focus on. So um, that gives you a sample of some of the, some of the work underway. And the last slide, um, the last initiative on slide 13, I just I wanted to call out was, again, a very strong piece of focus uh, and feedback through the industry plan was the need to focus on health and wellbeing. So that um, need for a framework to support the family violence and sexual assault and primary prevention sector um, is also a piece underway that we're working through with um, peaks and services. And again, a couple of you might be on working groups around that as well. So, um, Kit, I'm, shall I leave it there? And then yeah. I'm very happy to take questions. Um, I'm really keen to hear, obviously, the discussion throughout the day. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think we've got uh, just a few um, questions that have probably come up as well, which I might check in. Now, the next presentation that we've got is, um, I'll just end uh, the sharing so that uh, I can speak to you, sorry about that. Um, the next um, section that we've got up in the presentation is uh, is from our colleagues at um, uh, the Integrated Family Violence Partnerships. Now, those organisations will probably talk about some of the things that Rachel talked about, but also a few more things. So let's just take a moment while that's, that's, um, that's set up. We've heard about lots of strategies, capability frameworks. I know a few of you who came here today know about those capability frameworks, but a few of you don't. So that all information that was put here today, we're happy to share and provide more detail to you. We heard about some courses. Some of you might not have heard of that, the heard of them before. We've heard about some non-accredited courses, and there was probably for some of you a bit of jargon that was talked about there as well. So, um, a bit coming at you, as this comes at you, really asked for you to kind of connect with what's what's resonating with you, what questions are emerging with you, because we're going to ask you to, to share them as we go on. But what I'd like to do now is um, invite my colleagues um, uh, from the Integrated Family Violence Partnership to uh, present uh, their, some of their, their findings and their work on what's going on in the re re region. And Rose Burrell and Melissa Brown, I know you're here and I am going to um, share some, some slides with you today. So I don't know if you've got anything you want to do to open with, or, but I will hand over to you. Thank you, um, Kit. You can uh, go to the first slide if you like. Okay, I'm Rose Burrell. I'm the Principal Strategic Advisor for Family Violence um, in the Bayside Peninsula area and I work across those seven local government areas, basically from Portsea to Port Melbourne. Um, and our colleague Kath Mackay is here from the Southern Melbourne Partnership, so she can introduce how that one works as well. But the, the partnerships were introduced in about 2006 and the purpose of the partnerships is to try and help the help introduce the reforms that the government um, is trying to do and also to help with integration of all the services because as we know uh, family violence is made up of a lot of different services and sectors and they have in the past tended not to work very effectively together and I think certainly since the Royal Commission and possibly prior to that that's that's changing and has changed. Um, our partnership has a strategic plan. Um, I might get you to go to the next slide for me. Just to give you um, an overview of what I'm going to present today. So this is very much a very large part of our strategic plan as a partnership. And I'm just going to present some of the existing work that we're doing in the capacity building um, area because it's a huge pillar of our strat plan. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the initiatives around recruitment and retention. As Rachel mentioned, our Family Violence Social Work Graduate Year um, project. I'll talk a little bit about where a lot of these resources are kept, which is our SouthSafe website. So um, if you don't retain everything I say today, then, then there's a place you can go and have a look. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to our training coordinator, Melissa, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the Marum Collaborative Practice Training Module and other skills and knowledge um, activities that we are undertaking as a partnership. And I think Kath's going to add some um, additional uh, content for the Southern Melbourne Partnership as well. So let's start with the recruitment and retention strategy. Um, this project started a um, couple, probably three or four years ago. We recognised and, and coming new into this sector in this region, I noticed that we had some very experienced staff who every five minutes would pop up in a different organisation. So we had this amazing churn of um, the experienced family violence workers and not a lot of new people coming into the sector. And with all the changes and particularly uh, the Orange Door Initiative looming, we knew that there was going to be a massive number of new positions coming up and we didn't want to just see again the same people moving from organisation to organisation um, as those jobs came up. We wanted to see how we can get some new people in. Um, so I initially participated in a co-design sprint with um, Family Safety Victoria and as a group, a small group from all over the state, we were, we were given this issue to try or problem to try and solve, which was around how do you keep, get new grads into family violence and how do you keep them there? And we came up with a program that was basically, um, at that time we looked at, we called it from L's to P's. So how do you get these grads ready to work in the family violence sector? And coming from health, um, being a nurse, I'm not sure about that picture there. Um, I was <laughs> I was very familiar with how it worked in hospitals. So nurses went through a um, a very rigorous university course, came out as a nurse, walked into the wards, having done a bit of placement, a bit similar to social workers, and then they were not expected to suddenly be the experts in in practicing as a nurse. They were given a graduate year. So we took that kind of idea and tried to apply it to social workers. Um, and when we did a lot of um, research into this across the world, we found that this, this program is actually probably unique. Um, so we took the idea to Family Safety Victoria who also supported us. Um, so what does the program e exist? Next slide, please. So what do we offer? We went to um, initially um, Monash University, their social work degree um, people and promoted, but also promoted the program right across all the universities, but it was mostly Monash grads that took, took us up on it. We decided that um, we'd heard a lot, of, a lot of people talk about landing on their first day in child protection or in family violence and only to find that one of the other colleagues might be off sick or on leave. And so all her cases plus all these new cases were in a massive stack on the desk and that was your workload, which was out of control. Now that's, that's in the extreme areas, but we felt that in order for these grades to have space to learn, and again, it was similar to nurses and doctors and all sorts of people who get this grad year, you don't lump them with the full caseload from day one you let that build up so they can build their skills and have some space to learn so the the grads don't get a full caseload initially we give them a dedicated learning package which is basically all the courses that they need to do in the additional learning that they would like to do they get the time off from their their job to go and and do it um, and i know that in the last 12 months it's almost been death by webinar but there's been a lot of courses that have been offered. Um, 
we try and have tried, and again, this year it's been really challenging to give them an understanding of who's who in the zoo in terms of the rest of the sector. So spend some time with um, one of the most notable places was Jewish Care. So get some cultural understanding of how that service works. And Jewish Care were amazing and gave the grads um, time to um, spend with rabbis and people in the community and understand the cultural implications of family violence within that. Um, group but also other other places and because the grades all work in different organizations they also get a good sense of of each other's positions and the most um, popular part of the program is a monthly community of practice that they do with our coordinator Deb Weston who is ex-lecturer from Monash Social Work who ran the family violence set, um, subject there and she's now working with our watch so that's even um, brought a new dimension to the way that she runs that community of practice. So the community of practice sessions are held half a day once a month. Um, and the positive feedback we get from that activity is amazing. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. So, so this is just a year to get used to working as a social worker. Um, that transition from being a student to someone who's now responsible in a fairly demanding area. It's um, you know family violence. So it's how do you get the people in? and how do you support them? Um, and if you go to the next slide for me. Okay, so there's a lot of words on that slide. I'm sorry about that, but we did evaluate the program after two years to have a look at how we were going. And um, we found that the community of practice was the most popular thing. But again, overwhelmingly, we found that many of the grads were telling us that if they hadn't had that grad year, to be introduced to this work, they would not still be working in the sector. So the retention stuff is really pow powerful in terms of how we actually introduce workers to this area. And the project that's really complemented it, the other project that was um, funded by Family Safety Victoria was a project called Enhanced Pathways. And that's taking, um, getting organisations who employ these staff to um, beef up their capacity to supervise more students. So there's been a lot of training around how you supervise the students within the organisation. And those students are getting a lot more exposure to family violence before they graduate. graduate. So we're hoping that the graduate program, the need for the extra professional development will reduce as these grads actually maybe do some family violence training and family violence placements during their social work degrees. So it's all going to streamline through the Enhanced Pathways project, which is when they're a student and they do a family violence placement and then they go into the workforce in the family violence sector. Um, what are the limitations of the program? Really just making sure there's a vacancy and an organisation that's willing to take on these grads. And so far within the Family Violence Partnership across Bayside, we've had fantastic uptake. And so we've been averaging about, at the moment, about five or six grads every year for the last three years going through the program. And we have retained those grads in the sector. A couple have gone to the other side of the city, probably because they live there, but they've certainly remained in the Family Violence sector, which is fantastic. Um, so that's the grad program and, and the, the whole of the partnership. And I know there's a lot of people here um, today who are members of our partnership are supporting this program and we're hoping to grow it and, um, and get more grads in places like the Orange Door and stuff and support them to stay in the sector. So that's our grad program. Um, and it's really interesting because they, they all get really good supervision. It was interesting to see Rachel's slide about supervision, how people are mostly satisfied with that, what they're getting through work. But there's a point of difference with the grads in that they say that they can, they feel very comfortable talking in their community of practice because it's outside their organisation. So they don't feel they're being judged about how good they are at their job by their manager when they and so they can actually it does free them up to talk about sort of broader issues around working without feeling like they're failing in some way. Um, so that's our grad program. Can we have the next slide? I think this is up to Melissa. So I just want to mention quickly um, there is a South Safe website which is for the Bayside Peninsula area. All our training 
capacity building, links to all the peak bodies and um, everything a professional person in the Bayside Peninsula area working in family violence and, um, can find out all those activities on that website. So it's not a public, it's not a website that's designed for public access. I'm sure public can access it, but it, it'll tell you where you can find a group for a particular client. It'll tell you what events are coming up, what forums, what education opportunities there are. So that's a great resource that we've developed. Um, and there's a link to the jobs portal on that website as well. So I'll hand over now to our training coordinator, Melissa. Hello, um, hello everybody. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Melissa. Continue. Thanks, Rose. Um, so uh, nice to see a lot of familiar faces and friendly smiles. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, continuing on from Rose's point uh, about our training in the area, some of you I think have probably seen bits and bobs of this anyway. Um, so we have, um, as a partnership, tried to address particularly um, training demands where they have needed to be. Um, and one, uh, as you can see here with my wanted poster, everybody wants an up-to-date skills person with family violence knowledge and the established experience and good current practice. Uh, so, you know, we all do our best as we can. Um, we have rolled out, um, a, when I first started with Rose about three years ago, um, the introduction to family violence training. We still do offer that in a limited capacity. When Marum came out, it be it sort of went to the back burner, um, but uh, we do still offer it for particularly certain uh, gaps in community um, cohorts that may need just a little bit of knowledge or want a little bit of knowledge before um, moving on to whether they need to have more um, exposure uh, as a program might come up or they might have clients that come in and they want their staff to have a bit more knowledge. Um, as Rosa said, I also run the Marum Collaborative Practice Online Training for the Southern Region um, at the moment. And, um, and we're looking at now also specifically for next year, um, I'm putting together a embedding, um, Marum embedding program um, where we're looking at doing a, a workshop and then having ongoing support. And what does that look like? Um, if I may please have the next slide. So um, the introduction of family violence, uh, we were running it to as a general kind of um, training um, for two hours. Um, and we have now become more industry specific. So um, some of the groups that we've now tailored that introduction of family violence, um, we've made it more around what kind of, uh, examples and narratives and uh, experiences that particular workers may um, uh, need or have in their exposure to um, coming across clients or um, families that have been experiencing family violence. So um, we've done a bit for Star Health with early learning educators. Um, we've done some work with community centre staff. I was running some workshops out of um, Hyatt Community Centre and various community centre staff were coming through. Um, we've done work with a couple of the municipalities. So um, I did some training with the city of Kingston um, in uh, one of their departments where they wanted to have council workers having some good understanding what to look out for with family violence. Um, and then we've also done some training with just some reception and administration staff. So um, what we what we offer in that training is to make sure that if uh, the uh, organisation isn't part of the Marums or not needing to be um, in that space, but uh, noticing a demand, um, or they just want to be ahead of it, um, that we get approached to then do the introduction uh, to family violence. And as you can see there, those are some of the topics we include. Um, I 
also take a lot of handouts. So like the Duluth uh, wheel model and um, a narrative chart to refer to, if particularly that organisations working with children and families, what to look out for um, and how to approach um, clients that may be experiencing family violence specifically with children, say under school age. Um, so yeah, I, I provide a lot of resources too, so that they feel that there's more to just what is said in the introduction. Uh, next slide, please. And then as you can see here, we've got our uh, Marum Collaborative Practice Training. Uh, it's the sort of last of the modules that come and bring all of the togetherness of the foundations, the knowledge around risk assessing, and um, the FIS and CIS. And so um, we make sure that uh, each of the trainings are you know, relevant and also um, talk to the participants that are there on the day. So we just recently, uh, Bev and I, who's my co-facilitator with me, um, on uh, Monday, yesterday, we ran one with eight people, mostly from Uniting and um, PHCN. And so we were very mindful that when we were doing the run through of the main activities, we were being very specific about some of the knowledge and experiences the participants brought with them so that they got a lot more out of just being um, going through the narrative of what the collaborative practice training was, was all about. If I have the next slide, please. So yeah, just looking at how does the collaborative uh, practice training align back with industry planning and what is the, what is the responsibility in the workforce of um, having that training is really important. We try to address that with specifically, um, we do a, a really engaged, hopefully engaged approach to the collaborative practice risk management plan activity, which is our afternoon, um, our afternoon activity. And so we try to align a lot of um, uh, not just the theory, but also applying the practice of where does this sit in with the bigger picture and what does that look like and how does that help the individual participant or practitioner attending um, in their work, everyday work. Um, and so we want to try and make sure that it aligns with also the bigger picture of the MAM framework. Um, and then if we go on the next slide, please. Um, looking at now our new program that I'm um, starting to put together, um, the Marim Embedding. So um, if you haven't had a chance yet, when the release of all the information came out in August, um, if you have, I've printed out all the stuff and started to read through it, it's like a folder that thick, um, of uh, what, what stages it takes to get through the embedding and the audit tools and understanding um, how there are maybe gaps in that process for um, not just applying the training, but also the long-term journey of um, embedding MARAM as a everyday practice tool for practitioners. Um, how does it change your policies? How does it change your organizational structures? Um, do there need to be other resources or top-ups for practitioners at different levels or in, in different tiers? Um, so we are um, starting to put together that for next year and um, we're going to be um, having then a consultation group as well to support um, how individual organisational needs may, some may need more assistance than others in that embedding process. And if I last slide, please. Um, and then, yeah, uh, we've also done a lot of work in um, running uh, forums, symposiums. Um, Bev and I just recently ran a symposium with all the MAM Collaborative Practice trainers uh, not too long ago to find out across the state, how has everybody found running the Collaborative Practice training? Um, and we're planning another one in February um, as a follow-up as to that particular module, what um, has been helpful or not helpful, how a number's been, what has been the feedback, and, and, and opening up a discussion around that particular module of training with other practitioners, uh, other training practitioners across the state. Um, we also are working on expanding the capacity building framework within the partnership. 
um, and looking at, at uh, working groups and committees to help um, develop a community of practice, whether we need to have some that are specific in certain cohorts and areas, um, or what does that look like in, in bringing that together to the, the greater voice of the partnership. Um, and then we have conducted just this year, just to maintain the finger on the pulse of what's going on in Southern region, um, we have run some uh, industry leader consultation interviews, which we were calling the COVID conversations, um, which were really good, where we were touching base every week with a leader in um, the family violence uh, service industry. Um, what, was, uh, what was the impact of COVID and the service they that they were overseeing um, or their their um, engagement with that particular area. So we had somebody from housing, we had somebody from the courts, we had somebody from um, refuge, we had um, uh, really wanted to know and, and we're looking at maybe doing those again next year, um, maybe not called COVID conversations because we'd like to probably drop the COVID part, but uh, by all means, uh, maybe looking at um, engaging sort of these kinds of um, networking approaches that help us keep uh, supported with each other and um, not just being around connected through training, but we are trying to make sure that there is a, 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 a net of um, where we can all have uh, dialogue and, and narratives around what's going on in the industry. And that's, uh, yeah, anybody got a Q&A, by all means. Or oh, Kath. Kath, go to Kath, please go to Kath. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And that's good timing because I'm about to have to just jump off into another meeting. So apologies if I talk a little bit quickly. Um, so thank you to Rose and Melissa for putting in all that work from the Bayside Peninsula Family Violence Partnership, because essentially I'm just coming in off the back of them and saying, hey, we do the same thing in southern Melbourne as well. Um, so I don't need to repeat all of that information, but just letting you know that in Southern Melbourne, there's also a family violence partnership. For anyone that may be interested, I'm just going to put in a plug. We're actually recruiting for Rose's position in the South, Principal Strategic Advisor. So if it does tweak your interest or if you are able to pass it on to friends or colleagues, have a look at the Uniting Victoria Tasmania website or it should also be on the Family Violence Jobs Portal as well. So that's just a bit of a shameless plug. Thank you. Um, but certainly we're in the process, we're a little bit behind BPA due to some auspicing arrangement changes, but we're essentially in the processing of developing an action plan at the moment for the South. Um, workforce capacity building is going to be a key feature of that plan. Already there's things occurring. So the MARAM training, for example, is also occurring in the South. Uh, agencies are sending their staff on the information sharing scheme training and the risk assessment Marin training. So that's certainly happening. We've got communities of practice running, which is a feature and we'll continue to build on. Uh, and we're also looking at how we implement or have a shared approach to evidence informed practice uh, across the region as well. Some of you may be familiar with something called the Safe and Together model. And I know that that's something that lots of agencies are investing in their staff and committed to having their staff trained in and embedding that in their practice. Um, I guess the other thing to note for the South is that we're actually a merge practice, uh, a partnership. So part of the recent changes in governance arrangements and the way we do things um, is that we are the family violence partnership, but part of our membership is also what were in our area um, the family violence capacity building roles in mental health and uh, alcohol and other drugs. So those positions and what was the this is probably a bit of jargon, what we used to be called the Area Implementation Committee with the alcohol and other drugs and mental health capacity building roles are now merged into the broader family violence partnership in the South. So that's something a little bit different from Bayside Peninsula. Um, and I guess the other main thing to mention for us is we have, so Bayside Peninsula's got the orange door. They were in the first rollout and luckily for us have been a guinea pig and there's been lots of learnings from the from the orange door in Bayside Peninsula 
We've now got the announcement that the Orange Door is coming in the south, will be open by the end of 2021, and planning for that is well underway. So there will be lots of opportunities in terms of workforce opportunities for the Southern Orange Door, and that's certainly something to be mindful of um, and to be aware of and to be watching this space. So that's, right. I guess, yeah, from the south, something to mention as well. And that's probably it for me. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Integrated Family Violence Partnership. That was amazing. We're going to just do a quick Q&A because I notice there's a few questions coming up. And while that's occurring, um, my wonderful colleague, Lucy McGill, is just making people, putting people into breakout rooms, which will soon activate um, and use that Jamboard. My question for the partnerships is, in addition to the two courses in prevention, because we've got a few people here that um, were from the prevention side, what else is occurring in the non-accredited space? So hopefully everyone's understanding what I mean by the non-accredited space. So that's non-vet, non-TAFE around primary prevention. Anyone want to answer that question from the family partnerships or even WISE? So I think Melissa, you're leaning in, is that right? Nothing that I can I can yeah. actually put my finger on. Yeah. So Kit, think, we rely on the women's health services. Yeah. Um, so but. so there's a course in gender equity that I know a few of you are aware of. And of course, there's the same sort of capability in the non-accredited space that's occurring with um, in the primary prevention. And to some extent, that's less structured, I think, because it tends to merge with the gender equity uh, as well. And I know that the Chisholm team also talk about primary prevention in their courses as well. Um, thanks so much. We had a question that came up um, about that as well. Um, someone else has asked, and I might ask colleagues about this, NTV just sent an update on the Victorian government's family violence budget announcements. Do you have any idea what they mean by 240 trainee-ships? Raylene, Elsa, you'll just know that like that, won't you? Or maybe Rachel does. Um, I'm happy to talk to this. Yes, it's Thank um, you. A, good, <laughs> a good question. So um, as part of the state budget announcement, which was obviously um, in, the, in the very recent past, um, there was two small parts to build onto the industry plan. One was a, it's a three-year program for family violence traineeships. It will be in family violence, sexual assault um, and we are working out what the model will look like. I think probably first cab off the rank to say very conscious of bringing traineeships into a space in terms of working um, in the context of, um, you know, trauma and so on. And so how we do that will be really careful to make sure there's both, um, you know, the right layer of work and yep. support and that um, organisations also feel resourced. So the, the funding is for supporting these traineeships right. uh, where organisations will host. So lots of work to do. We're working closely with the peaks in relation to what that looks like, but great opportunities to think about different cohorts. So um, I think the government's announcement today around the budget, you can see, or you will see there's a really strong focus in relation to Aboriginal workforce, diversity of workforce, jobs in general, because of the kind of current economic environment we're in. But um, we'll, we will certainly be consulting, um, you know, through the peaks in relation to what is going to work for the sector. Yeah. There is other, that, another Rose, you'll be very, um, uh, and I can just see your point, happy to offer training. Um, the other small bit, we only got one year of funding is for a family violence graduate program. So we will certainly be talking to all of those who've been doing the work, um, Rose and all those in the Southern region in relation to how do we make sure we can build on that, turn that into something sustainable. So okay. that's Fantastic. some of that context, yeah. Good, that's been great. waiting for that one. <laughs> that's great. So um, what we've got colleagues is we've got, um, a lot of activity going on. I've got a question. You can just raise your hand or put it in the chat. Were there some new things that you didn't know about in all that information that was shared? Was there any new words that were discussed? Maybe just pop it into the chat. I know some of you hadn't been familiar with Marum in your responses. And there were a few people that didn't know about, for instance, that there's traineeships 
in community services. Is there anything in those two presentations that was news to you? Some people saying it'd be great if there was something offered to dentists or anything like that. Um, the capability frameworks would love to know more about that as well. Okay, so the next thing I think we'd like to do is to put us into the breakout rooms. Now, the way that we're going to structure these breakout rooms is there's going to be two parts to it. You'll go into the first part and what we'll be getting you to do is to ask you what are the challenges that you see for this region, right, for this region. And we're going to be using a tool called Jamboard, which lets you post directly on it, right? So you'll get a link from the facilitators um, in the chat and you'll be able to post on that. And the facilitators, if that's not working for you, they can post things as well. We'll then bring you back. And what we're going to do is then talk with uh, the colleagues, Raylene and Elsa from Chisholm. They're going to describe what a career and education pathway is and why they're helpful and why they're needed. And then we'll go back into our breakout rooms, the same groups of people, and we will then discuss, well, actually, would that be helpful for what we're working on today? All right. So I'm going to ask my colleague Lucy to activate those uh, breakout rooms. And the colleagues will have the links to the jam boards in this. Um, Absolutely, we'll try and get all those those presentations out to you. Thanks, Julie. Um, we'll get those if the, your colleagues will have the links and we'll share those in the chat. So just a few minutes, we'll make those breakout rooms happen. Thanks, Lucy. So hopefully you should all be receiving a pop up to move to the room. There are three rooms, um, each with about nine people in them. So I'll stay on and if anyone has any problem um, joining their room, just give me a shout out and I can talk you through it. Gay and Elsa, how are you guys going? All good? And I've got Zoe and Nileen still here with me. Did you want us to join the breakout rooms as well? Um, did you want to? You don't have to. You can stay here with me, but um, I'm just going to stop recording. Isn't it? It's so brutal, the way the breakout rooms pull your way. Now, hopefully in that little moment, you got the opportunity to share um, lots of ideas about what was going on that you want to address and we'll come back to those in a second and we'll think about solutions but now what I want to do is want to hand over for the next a few minutes to my colleagues from Chisholm um, and have I forgot them here have they all come yes back? yes oh there you are <laughs> um, and I'm going to share the screens with with, with Ilsa and with uh, Raylene to just chat about um, what is a career pathway and what they do. So over to you and hopefully you're able to share your screen. Uh, yes, yes, I've got it up now. Thanks, Kit. Um, and thank you everyone else for some really interesting information um, that we had uh, delivered already in the first hour. Um, so I've shared my screen. I'm hoping everybody can see that. And I hope that Raylene has joined me as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk for the next 10, 15 minutes around education pathways and hopefully um, give some information around what an educational journey, an educational pathway looks like in this space. Um, so my name is Ilsa Evans. I'm the Higher Education Coordinator at Chisholm and my colleague Raylene Stockton is the Manager of the Community Services Department. So before we get started, um, we'd like to also uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians, the lands in which on which we meet today and pay our respects to their elders past, present, emerging, um, and acknowledge everyone else also who have joined us here today. So um, 
At Chisholm, we've become, and we have been for some time, I've been at Chisholm, I've told last week, I've been here for 10 years, so um, it's gone quite quickly, but in the time, I think we've always been very focused on the delivery of family violence uh, courses. Um, we've embedded family violence subjects into um, our diplomas, etc. And then, of course, with the um, recommendations from the Royal Commission that has stepped up dramatically, which has been fantastic to see. So uh, we're quite keen on ensuring that our courses all respond to those recommendations. Um, and then, of course, we've got the Gender Equality Act um, of 2020, the Victorian one. We also um, have a number of course advisory committees for each of our courses, as well as steering committees, so that we remain responsive to the needs of industry. And, you know, things that we're told, such as um, waiting lists for services, workforce shortages, etc. Education into practice promotes expansion of staff skills and knowledge to be better able to meet client needs. Um, it enables uh, greater staff retention. Um, it enables professional development and enhances career trajectories. Um, we also um, see um, our courses um, supporting the development of a gender lens that can be applied to work roles, supporting gender equity in the workplace with internal and external stakeholders, designing and implementing processes of policy, and of course, gender equity assessments and the application of a gender strategy. Um, so we're going to talk to those in a little more detail as we go through. So to start, to start off though, what does an educational pathway look like? And the first slide that we've included here is the AQF frameworks wheel, which is a handy one, I think, because we often hear the word AQF1, AQF7, AQF8, and um, don't really, aren't able to put that into context. So the AQF framework is the National Policy for Regulated Qualifications in Australian Education and Training. It incorporates the qualifications from each education and training sector into a single comprehensive national qualifications framework. So you see here, of course, that a certificate one is at level one, uh, two at two, it starts off quite simple, um, three at three, four, um, many people may have heard of the Cert four in training and assessment, for example, that sits at AQF four. And then we get into the diplomas at five, associate diplomas and associate degrees at six, bachelors at seven, and then an honours degree or a grad cert, where my grad cert in family violence that we offer at Chisholm six at eight, uh, masters at nine and a doctoral at 10. It doesn't mean necessarily that these are sequential. Um, you don't have to start at a certain point and move up one by one. For instance, entry into a graduate certificate, generally speaking, is through a bachelor degree or a diploma plus a number of years industry experience. So that you could, could go straight from a diploma with some industry experience into an AQF 8 um, grad cert. So that just gives you a sense of what the AQF framework looks like. And then from there, um, I'm going to hand over to Raylene, who is going to talk about the um, courses that we offer at Chisholm in the VET space. Hi everyone. So um, what you can see in front of you is just um, a summary of the courses that's delivered in um, the community services area. And we go from a cert three up into a diploma, a diploma level. Um, and obviously the, um, as we go up in an AQF level, there's a high level of expectation in relation to the amount of responsibility and the amount of knowledge that um, a worker um, will come out of after they've finished, finished the course. We've got a number of free TAFE um, courses at the moment, which I've listed on there. But I think the, the main thing to notice um, is that we're, um, with the, in relation to the, the new course in coming out last or earlier this year, we've chosen the unit in, the, um, in that course to actually embed in um, a number of our courses. So I guess our focus has been on, I understand that we need to actually, you know, provide additional training and support for people currently in the workforce, but how do we also look at that, you know, the other side of that in that we, um, have 
more, um, I guess, better trained, work ready people who have some experience around the farm, family violence sector in relation to that to that knowledge that they might encounter. So that that unit is a universal unit. So anyone looking at you know working in that sector may um, you know may be presented with someone who talks about family violence. And I guess it's important for us to ensure that when our students come out, they know how to respond to that at that level. So we've embedded that in the Diploma of Community Services, Diploma of Youth Work, the Cert for in Mental Health, the Cert for in Mental Health Peer Work, and the Diploma of Counselling. So the reason that we haven't got it in all the courses yet is because that takes a little bit of organisation to take units out and put units back in so we will put we will actually progress to actually putting in um, all of the courses that we deliver there's also discussions with um, other areas in Chisholm, such as health and in um, early childhood, at looking at whether we will embed this unit also in some of the units that they deliver. Because I guess from us, it's really important that we uh, Chisholm students can be, you know, as workforce ready to deal um, with, you know, presentations of, of people who might have um, a, a family violence and come and talk to, I guess, a worker just in a unit universal organisation. Um, our courses run, um, they've been running online at the moment. Um, however, that, um, you know, generally they're face to face and that's mainly the experience of our, um, you know, students that come through and started at a, a VET course. Um, I see that there was a few um, chats coming up there. Um, Oh, and we can, we'll, we'll end up talking about the grad cert in a little bit more um, detail as well, where there, there was a question in relation um, to that. Um, so I'll just go on to the next slide, if I can, Elsa. And um, I guess we were trying to do a pathway with with lines and that didn't didn't really work um, for us. And I guess, you know, we look at, you know, education pathway isn't about that you, you know, you follow a straight trajectory because often in the community services sector, you will build the different skills that you need to actually get, you know, a breadth of knowledge to work with the range of clients that you might be presented with. So um, these are building blocks, which and they'll, they show the most direct study path, but that doesn't mean that you have to actually follow that path to get to get to there. So when if you look at the um, darker blue um, scrolls where there's direct entry into the course, you can start in the Cert 3 in community services, the Cert 4 in drug and alcohol, mental health, peer work, Cert for, in, cert for in youth work. And then there is a direct pathway where you get credits into the um, diploma above that. So you would go, you could, you would go from a Cert 3 community services into a diploma and get credits. The Cert for mental health, you would get credits and go into um, the diploma of mental health and the same for youth work. Then as you go up into the, the next level, the diploma level, that is, also, that is also direct entry. So you don't, as Ilsa was saying, you don't actually have to start at the one and work your way up, that you can actually enter at the level that's most appropriate for people's learnings, learning abilities and um, study capacity that they have at the moment, at, the, at that stage of when they enter. Once we go to the Diploma of Community Services, if you, you can look at that, we've got the Graduate Certificate in Family Violence, and Ilsa will talk a little bit more about that, you know, as, as we go on. Um, to enter into that, you do need a diploma and at least two years ex sector experience or a, or a degree. So there's not a direct pathway, but you could certainly have your qualification work for a sector and then come back and, and refine, you know, your, your skills or actually realise that that's a sector a family violence is a sector that you're really passionate about. And you do get the family violence unit um, in the Diploma of Community Services. In the Diploma of Mental Health, you can actually progress up to the um, Bachelor of, of uh, Community Mental Health. And there is a direct um, 
direct credits in relation to that course as well. However, you don't have to follow, as I said, those direct building blocks. You could actually start off in, you know, community services and go to Diploma of Mental Health or either way. It's just about the credits that you get as you go along. On the end of that um, slide there, I've got the um, course in identifying and responding to family violence risk. And as you can see, I've just asterisked the unit that's um, in that course. And that is the unit that we've put in the courses on this previous slide. So anyone coming through um, our qualifications will have done that one, will have done that unit. So they're already coming out with that um, with that unit. We're also looking at um, I guess, and I guess that's been our focus to try and embed that to make our, you know, students more workforce ready. The next phase is actually delivering that to um, sector, because I know that there is a, a great demand. And on the next slide, I've just got um, a, uh, if people are um, interested in this course, then um, I've got a link there that would, I'll put in the chat after I've finished speaking and people can just register. And if you want more information about how we're delivering that into next, in, in next year, then I can actually provide that for you. Um, family violence is, yeah. So um, I, I'll put that in the chat as we move along. Sorry, just a bit distracted by the chats. And yeah, I'll no, that's fine. We've got all those. We've got all those questions and they're great questions. They might be answered through the next piece yeah. of work that we're about to do too. Okay, so I'll hand back to Ilsa. Um, thanks, Raylene. So a little bit more on our graduate certificate in family violence. And I think um, one of the things that's important to um, recognise is our grad cert sits in the higher ed space. It did start off some years ago in the vet space and we um, moved it over to the higher ed space. Um, I, Rachel was speaking earlier about a graduate certificate in family violence being under development, um, which my understanding is will sit in the vet space. It doesn't mean that they're different AQF levels, they're all AQF8. Um, our graduate certificate uh, has been running now for three years in the HE space and for probably about three years before that in the vet space. Uh, it's evidence-based, industry-relevant qualification developed by a very strong course advisory committee of which two members are here today, um, of academics, family violence advocates, including lived experience and representatives from the sector. Um, we were really fortunate that uh, we were doing the trans, uh, you know, during the writing of the new version, the HE version, as the Royal Commission handed down their recommendations. So we were able to be quite responsive. Um, aims to produce professionals who can respond critically to current and future of the industry, sits in HE space, as I mentioned, which means that it's um, the accrediting body is TEXA, uh, so it's nationally recognised. There's an information session if anybody is interested uh, this week, in a couple of days, on uh, Thursday at 5pm. If you are interested, um, simply go to the Chisholm website and, or Google Graduate Student and Family Violence and uh, a button should come up for you to log in and uh, register for that information session. Um, it's, we've um, had a range of different uh, students from a range of different sectors who, and who have come in to do our grad cert from um, quite a few nurses from the health sector who have wanted to broaden their knowledge base. We've had people from the police uh, force. We've had a number of people wanting to come into the family violence sector as well as oh. within the family violence sector who have wanted to um, upskill their, I suppose, their qualifications. So it's been really interesting to see the incredible range of backgrounds, paramedics, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So and to the next one, we thought we'd mention quickly the courses we have currently under development. Mm. Wow. Um, yes. Yeah, so we're, we're really uh, building okay. our area in this, you know, in the family violence and related areas. So there's the course in Intermediate Risk Assessment and Management, which was mentioned before, um, which is under development um, uh, externally, um, which we will be delivering as well. The course in Contributing to Primary Prevention, uh, which is the, in the same um, category. 
uh, the course in gender equity, which I think uh, Kit mentioned earlier. Yep. And then we're uh, developing at Chisholm at the moment a bachelor in psychology, which we're hoping to roll out um, in the next, um, in probably about 12 months, I would imagine. And then also my um, current project, which is the Graduate Certificate in Family Violence Men's Behaviour Change, um, which we heard from industry um, is uh, something we really need in the Southeast Corridor, uh, that qualification. And we know, of course, that um, we need more practitioners in that area. So we're looking to link that with our existing graduate certificate. Um, so that's, that's my current project. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, so that's thank brilliant. You very much. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Raylene and Ilsa, for the great work that you are doing. Um, I'm conscious of time. So um, I want to acknowledge all the questions that are coming up, right? And uh, I, I think um, what I'll say is that WISE will absolutely capture those and try to answer those out of session. But interestingly, there'll be some that we can't or some that we can't. And I think the higher order issue is that the questions that I'm reading across here are about information. What is the linkage? How do I go from here to here? Someone has just said, well, hang on, if I've got a bachelor in criminology and criminal justice, does that mean I get access to the family violence sector? I've been looking through the jam boards and people are going, the family violence sector is huge. So there is clearly this opportunity for mapping. And I just want to go back to that star thing, what Ilsa said, a map, a career map provides guidance on direction. And you saw in that last slide, the courses that Chisholm, the huge public provider in our region is working to that are different to what Rachel spoke of, that are different to what Rosemary spoke of, right? So now what I want to do is I want to take us into the last um, breakout session, right? So this breakout session is going to ask you two questions. Given the issues that you talked about, what solutions could address those challenges? And you talked about you need more of this and more of that, more facilitators, more men's behaviour change, more court workers. Um, some people said if, you, if there's a big slush of funding that comes through, we can't find enough people, we can't retain them. My question is, could an education and career pathway help? And how would that help? We are gonna ask after this that each of those groups share what they find. So we're gonna ask you also in this next six to seven minutes, or even sooner, because we're running short of time, to choose a spokesperson for the debrief, All right? So I'm gonna again ask Lucy if um, she would not mind um, sending us into the breakout rooms. We'll use the jam board again um, and uh, we'll uh, move forward onto our last session, which will only be a few more pieces to get, to get going. Thank you so much. Hopefully you all had a chance to share some ideas on where to next. What I'm going to ask folk now is if you are able to, we're group one, so we're happy to go first, but then we'll go through um, the other groups as well. What I want to do is ask for us to share, but as we share, the other groups just add what's new, right? Because we'll have those jam boards that we can bring things back together. So my group, is there anyone who'd like to speak for our team or if not I'm happy to I think I've just everyone's just taken a step backward and I've been left in the front so I will do that so I'm going to share with you um, uh, our, our chatbot and I invite others to, to do so as you go so look where we started off in terms of um, the problems that we identified there's so much going on. It's so great. There's lots happening in response training. But it's good to have sort of more options really transparent around PEVO or NGE. There is a huge marum fatigue. Um, but response training also includes um, 
PVOR and GE. So how do you distinguish that? There is this huge thing about difficulty fulfilling positions when there's an injection of funds, particularly in the court workers. Um, and, and there's gaps in terms of the skills and the people to help people in, in courts as well. So that was something that came up. So I don't know if anyone's got anything to add when we get to use. But in terms of uh, the solutions, there was a lot around the communication of those pathways that exist. Um, there was a lot of conversation about, well, hang on, what does the minimum standards mean? Rachel, did you, uh, Rachel Green, did you want to say something quickly on this, on Rep 209? Um, yeah, thanks, Kit. It was more just to say to people, I think lots of these questions are exactly what we're grappling with, with how do we support a transition and implementation of the of Rec 209 for the middle of next year. So there will be funding for what we're calling transition offices um, through the peak um, that will support organisations. We will absolutely work with the PSAs in relation to translating that out to regions and with TAFEs and RTOs in relation to that element. But the Wonderful. comms around the pathways, reinforcing about lived experience is always a pathway cultural experience is gonna be essential. So yes, I guess more to come, I think, but. Very, this is really helpful. Yeah, but I think it's also from industry, it, we need to be clear about what it means if you're not the social worker. Um, we need social work year is great, but how do we get more people used it? We need to get industry understanding the value of that graduate experience, like in health, there's lots of things there. The promote the career pathway, that the different courses, how they feed in, and indeed perhaps the non-accredited course and learning as well. Um, we need to build into understanding industry on the other qualifications that can do the job. So that was some of the things that came up um, for us. I was just wondering um, which group would like to go next? I don't know, Zoe or Laura? Yes, I'm happy to share for our group if everybody's happy with that. Thank you. Um, and happy to for you to share the screen, yep. Share the screen. Can everybody see that? Yep, Beautiful. Brilliant. Okay, so around the pressing needs, our group had some fantastic ideas and it was interesting that um, they kind of all aligned really. Um, so our headlines, I think, would be um, the pressing need to recruit um, a younger workforce, a more diverse workforce, and a lot of focus on a male workforce. So we had some discussion around um, how do we recruit um, men in both the prevention and the response sector. So um, really interesting that we kind of all came up with similar um, thoughts there around hmm. engaging men. And um, there was even some discussion around um, whether men might be able to um, volunteer as part of Women's Health Service. In terms of the solutions, um, well, we came up with um, building on uh, what you were talking about there, Kit, around the communication on the existing pathways. Mm. Um, Jackie was um, highlighting the importance of being really innovative and finding new ways to do it. Obviously, um, one of the great ways to do that is um, information evenings and tapping into um, networks at that regional level through um, existing relationships. And we spoke about the importance of making sure that um, people you know, don't go to that very pointy end when they think of our sector and always think about um, sitting directly um, doing client work, but that we do kind of broaden the scope um, of thinking for people around our sector. Um, Raylene mentioned um, opportunities to promote the workforce sector through um, placements for young people so they can actually have a taster um, of, of, of our sector. So um, so they were probably the key ideas there around how do we communicate and get, get the word out there. Yeah, yeah, careers advice came up with ours, Zoe. That's, that's really good to know. Thank you so much. And the next group, I think it's the third group or the final group, was that? Um, uh, we merged into two, I believe. Yeah, yes. we go. Yeah. <laughs> ah, beautiful. All right. So what um, we've got there, colleagues, I don't know if there's anyone else who'd like to add anything to that sort of ideas that they heard. Just for the first bit, when we had um, our third group, for the second part, I think we were all more. Um, I think theme was pretty much the same, the lines which being shared, um, except I think there was some strong sense of skill shortage for the South uh, Southern region. And um, mm. 
and around retention piece. So these were the two, I think, themes. Those were quite prominent in our discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Colleagues, we've got about seven minutes to end, and I know people have few people have had to drop off already, but I'm just going to bring this to a conclusion, if I may. I want to thank everyone for your attention and, and, and for being part of the conversation. This is, this is where we want to head to now. We're going to consolidate all this and report back on what our findings are. We're going to sort of distill what the presentations were, we're going to say what emerged from the discussions and, and theme the jam boards up. But we're going to send it to you to validate because where we're heading to is M um, WISE and um, Chisholm have signed an MOU. And that MOU, part of that MOU is about addressing the workforce development needs of this region. And what we've identified over the last couple of years is that we think that part of that is better communication of career and education pathways of what exist for our region. So we're going to consolidate, we'll feed back to you, we'll validate what we think the recommendations and the work plan is, but what we'd like to do is open it up that if anyone would like to become a member of that working group, we invite you to become a part of it. There will be, we think, about four meetings a year, uh, Zoom probably, but who knows by the end we might be in a hybrid model or something. But it's really about pacing and leering and drawing that out. There are existing career path models. We don't need to replicate the wheel that already exists. But part of the work is to do that, but also to translate those capability frameworks and statewide initiatives into our region with the industry. In closing, I'd like to thank absolutely my colleagues at WISE. I'd like to thank you again. I'd like to thank the great um, members of the Chisholm team for their support, the Integrated Family Violence Partnerships, and also thanks to our guest speaker, Rachel, from Family Safety Victoria. We have an evaluation. Um, we will send it out to you uh, as part of the follow-up from today, but if you are into the tech and you have got a phone on and you can take a little picture of the QR code, um, uh, please uh, do so. Um, we will get the results out to you ASAP. So just again, thank you so much for today. I'm so glad that we're going to be able to end, um, uh, end on time today. But if you have... Um, any other queries that are right there, the, um, the websites uh, that you can go to. Um, can I again reiterate, if you'd like to become a member of the working group between Chisholm and WISE to implement some of the things that come out today, please feel free to let us know. If there's no other queries, comments or concern, um, thank you so much, everyone. And I will close the forum and thank you all. Well done. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.